My name is Benjamin Garber and I'm a Holocaust survivor. And two summers ago, my three children came to me and said that they're aware how much I like to write and they heard me do presentations and psychiatric meetings. So they wondered why it is that I have never written about my Holocaust experience. Now I had no meaningful response except to say, who would I write it for? And they say, oh, well, you could write that write it for us, you could write it for yourself, and there happen to be other people who might be interested in hearing my story. And so today you happen to be the other people, and this is my story. I will do this in four parts. First, the family background, then life in the ghetto, after that hiding, and of course, last liberation. Now the city of Vilna, Poland, where I was born in 1936, was considered the premier seat of Jewish culture, religious fervor, Jewish literature and creativity in all of Eastern Europe. Vilna was also called Yerushalayim Delita, meaning Jerusalem of Lithuania. My mother took great pride in that she was born, raised and educated in Vilna. Her parents and my father's parents were wealthy Jewish merchants. Her parents in meats were my father's parents in lumber. My mother had two brothers, one older and one younger, and the older one was the family star as he was a brilliant law student. He and my mother were very competitive as he was my grandmother's favorite. The younger one worked in my grandparents' meat and sausage factory and was considered a hell raiser. I have seen pictures of my grandfather in which he appears to be a hard, stern patriarch. My mother adored him and he reciprocated the feelings. The boys attempted to rebel against him, however, without much success. My only connection with him was a family myth related to his smoking. He was a heavy cigarette smoker, and when I was born, he swore at my birth that he would never smoke again, but it was too late. The key person in the family constellation was my grandmother, my mother's mother, whom I loved and adored. In the early years of my life, my grandmother raised me. It seemed that my mother was never around, but my grandmother was always there. My mother was gone all of the time, and she was part of a work party that left the ghetto in the morning and came home late in the evening. They were making heavy boots for the German soldiers that were freezing on the Russian steps. Even when my mother was around, she was never around, as she was always up to something. Now, what that mysterious something was, I didn't figure out until some time later. Although I was able to construct a schematic picture of my mother's history and background, I didn't experience such luxury when it dealt with my father. When the subject was my father, there emerged a shadow or perhaps a hole, but which I had spent all my life trying to feel, fill, but never quite succeeded. What I learned about him did not emerge until years later, but even that was vague and sketchy. The main reason for my lack of knowledge about him is that when I was two and a half years old, he disappeared from my life. To compound the loss, my mother wrapped him in the shroud of silence, so that at times I doubted whether such a person ever existed. My father's name was Jonah, and he was the oldest of four siblings, having a sister and two brothers. All three of his siblings survived the Holocaust. Eventually, all three of them wound up in Israel. I'm assuming that the survival instinct of the Markman family are quite strong. As a result, I have several cousins and second cousins in Israel with whom I have maintained sporadic contact. I've always heard how smart my father was and that he was a highly successful attorney in Poland, which was impossible achievement for a Jew. He was an excellent student and highly ambitious, but that is the extent of my knowledge of his character as well as his talents. The issue of his death was an open question. One uncle attributed his death to the German troops that conquered Poland in two weeks in September of 1939. <clears throat> However, another one of my uncles felt that he was killed by the Russians at the Katyn Forest Massacre in Belarus in 1941. Now from my training in psychiatry and especially in psychoanalysis, I learned that a person's earliest memories are significant indicators of one's earliest conflicts and anxieties. 
The accuracy of the remembered material is not that significant, but it's the internal consistency of how these incidents fit together and the, with the rest of the narrative that ultimately determines its usefulness. The responses and attitudes of caretakers that permeate these early memories may be equally revealing in understanding a person's character formation. They may become significant markers that set the tone for future developmental issues. So for example, it may be significant that my parents were never a part of my earliest memories. Since my father was gone from two and a half on and my mother was never around, it's not surprising that my earliest memories focused on substitute caretakers. I must have been three or four as we were leaving a doctor's office when suddenly German airplanes appeared and they began to rain bombs. All that I remember is running down the street with my mother and nanny and the surrounding sounds of explosions. It was a beautiful summer day, which suddenly turned gray and foreboding. It is very difficult to forget the whistling sounds of falling bombs. My next memory is from age four. This memory is extremely detailed and vivid. It has also been recurring, so it has special meaning in the narrative of my life. We were staying at my grandmother's house and we were up on a balcony overlooking the courtyard. It was my mother, my grandmother, and my mother's older brother. Suddenly there was a commotion in the courtyard as people were milling about. A Lithuanian red-haired police, red-haired plainclothes policeman in a blue suit motioned for my uncle to come down. He went down, never to be seen again. When the Germans set up the ghetto, they tried to squeeze all the Jews of Vilna into one small part of the city. This was the old part with narrow cobblestone streets. My grandparents' house and their business were just inside the border of the ghetto, close to the main gate. All of a sudden, there were all these strangers in our house, while my mother, my grandmother, and I possessed the bedroom, which at the time was a luxury. While I was now totally aware of what was occurring, I did realize that people were disappearing. The Germans would suddenly swoop down at night or day and forcibly remove people from the streets or from their homes. These raids were called axes or actions. People were loaded into waiting trucks and were told that they were being taken to labor camps. Of course, that implied that they were coming back. However, we soon realized that they were being taken to destinations unknown and they did never, and they were never, never coming back. As a result, hiding became a commonplace activity when it was sensed that the Germans were coming. We became preoccupied with finding new, more obscure, and creative hiding places. Once we hid in the attic of my grandparents' house, there were many people, and it was crowded and hot and uncomfortable. There was no food or water. At first, there was a sense of, well, we were all in this together, but after a while, tempers became frayed and there ensued arguments. And so the stress of having to hide and the fear of being caught and removed was an ever-present danger. Another time we were hiding in a cellar. There were many people and a couple with a young baby. The baby started to cry and we could hear the Germans outside. Someone suggested stuffing a rag in the baby's mouth to keep it quiet. Fortunately, it never came to that as the Germans left and we survived this time. We did not understand nor appreciate that my grandparents' house was in a perfect location. It was on a corner where two large streets intersected. Since it was next to the main ghetto, then one could observe people coming and going in and out of the enclosure. One could see the guards and their changing shifts. By their uniforms, we could tell how many were German and how many were Lithuanians. We, re we realized that as the war progressed, there were less Germans as guards. We were also in a position to count ambulances since a large hospital was close to the ghetto. The more ambulances were seen going back and forth, especially in the winter, we assumed to be a sign that Germany was losing the war. It was these kind of observations, whether accurate or not, that fueled our optimism and the hopes of the approaching liberation. If part of our character is often shaped by molding and is molded by disturbing events from our childhood, and this would partly explain my wish to be quiet, to be somewhat secretive, and to avoid attracting attention at all costs. 
These incidents are some of my earliest memories of the occupation. I attribute meaning and significance to these events to in determining who I was and who I became. I'm also aware that our knowledge as to why people are the way they are is limited. There are just too many variables that shape a person's character. And so I feel somewhat entitled to attribute meaning to these events and their impact on my psyche. However, before I become too glib in attributing causality to random incidents, let's not lose sight of the fact that these incidents occurred within a matrix of constant fear and terror. Now, the Vilna Ghetto was created in 1941 and liquidated in September of 1943. I know this because my mother and I escaped from the ghetto the night before it was liquidated. It was one of the numerous coincidences that contributed to our survival. <clears throat> before the war, Vilna had a Jewish population of 60,000. The ghetto had a population of 40,000, 40, of which only 1,300 survived. The ghetto became a self-contained entity closed off by brick walls, barbed wire, and guards. That didn't stop individuals or small groups to get out if they set their mind to it by using bribes or other creative means. There were work parties that went into the city on a daily basis. The Lithuanian and Polish guards could be bribed with money or other favors. As a last resort, there were always the sewers. The odds of escaping the ghetto were in your favor if you knew or maintained contact with Polish families in the city. They didn't always work out as they would betray escapees to the police for promised rewards. The Judenrat or Jewish Council were responsible for the administration of the ghetto. There was also a ghetto police whose job it was to maintain order and to help the Germans round up people for deportation. I guess they felt that they would be spared. The leader of the ghetto was a man named Jacob Gans, and he must have been guided by some kind of magical fantasy. If he acceded to the German demands for more bodies, he could save people. When the demands grew bigger and bigger, he committed suicide. The Germans were smart enough to understand that if they were able to help normalize the life in the ghetto, there would be less resistance to the liquidation. The ghetto had excellent medical facilities that predated the German occupation. Consequently, there were no major disease epidemics compared to other ghettos. There were numerous cultural events, such as original plays, lectures, and concerts. I remember attending plays with my mother and grandmother. My mother knew one of the lead actresses from her school of this, so she went backstage several times to say hello. I'm sure the same place made me feel good. However, such moments were few and far between. I remember certain original songs that we would hum and sing, never say that this is the final path, my name is Srolik and I am a lad from the ghetto. The lyrics of the letter song had something to do with even though things are bad, I still managed to jump, dance and sing. I suppose that anything to make one feel better or good for a brief moment was significant. I must have had some kind of schooling that I am unable to recall. Maybe it was fuzzy because teachers just kept disappearing. I think that people in the ghetto made a concentrated effort to maintain a sense of normality under abnormal circumstances. How effective this was is impossible to determine, but the effort itself is somewhat meaningful and perhaps deceptive, deceptive because after all, we were waiting to die. By the time we regained the use of our house, most of the people were removed or went to live in other places. The unanswered question was what happened to these people was responded to with silence. I have little doubt that the main reason that I survived the ghetto experience relatively unscathed emotionally was the love and the protection of my grandmother. I missed her more than anyone I have ever been close with. She shielded me and protected me from all the terrible things around us. She enveloped me with her love so that nothing could harm me. She was always there no matter what the conditions or circumstances. I can easily recall her sad face but I never remember her smiling. But then how could she, as she already experienced multiple losses? While I was not privy to the conversations and dealings of adults, I got the sense that something was being planned and I did not dare ask what. I was sure that my questions would not be answered. 
I recognized rumblings that had to do with escaping the ghetto. There were rumors of concentration camps where people were being gassed. Not far from Vilna, there was a place called Ponar where people were killed and their bodies covered with soil and lime. I'm assuming that a large portion of the ghetto population is buried there. There was black bunting on the trees when the Russians defeated the Germans at the Battle of Stalingrad. There were recurrent rumors that Germany was losing the war and that there was an awareness that we would be killed or sent to concentration camps before the Russians could liberate us. There were rumors from war parties that people escaped into the forest to join the partisans. The forests in Poland and Belarus were places that people went to when they escaped the ghetto. While the surrounding forests were relatively safe havens of survival, we also heard that the Polish and Lithuanian populations were of little help to the escapees. I finally understood that my mother's frantic activity and occasional disappearances had something to do with our escaping the ghetto. My mother, in conjunction with other people, was setting up a hiding place outside the city. While I have been rather critical of my mother's mothering and her relationship with my grandmother, I was equally cognizant of her many strengths and the resilience of her character. She was very resourceful as she had ample funds at her disposal, which made our life a little bit easier. And so the prearranged day for our escape finally arrived. All that I remember was that it was cold and dark. I was dressed in several layers of clothing since there was a limit to how much we could carry. My grandmother and I stood in the courtyard, which was next to the gate, while my mother was negotiating with the guards about money, a common occurrence. As my mother was walking back, I realized that my grandmother was not coming with us and that we were leaving her behind. As I was saying goodbye to her, I asked if I would ever see her again, and she said that she didn't know. The next moment, all I remember is that my mother grabbed me by the arm and we hurriedly walked out the front gate. The question of why we left my grandmother behind is something that has stayed with me and haunted me most of my life. The simplistic way of looking at it was that for everyone that survives, someone has to pay the price. So I lived and my grandmother died. That doesn't address the basic question about the choices that people make. Such choices are part of the Holocaust equation. I did ask my mother about it more than once and because I missed my grandmother. I didn't get much of her response except some dismissive comment that I would not understand. My mother was never good at confronting emotionally charged issues, such as what my father was like. Maybe it was a practical decision in which she felt that my grandmother would be much of a burden because of her age. It is possible that the guards would allow only two people to leave, so my mother had to make a painful choice. It was also possible that my grandmother refused to leave and chose to remain where things were familiar rather than take a chance on the unknown. And so when I was little, I felt that it was my fault that she died and that my mother chose to save me. My mother was excellent at reinforcing that belief. Whenever she was unhappy with me, she would let me know that she wished that she had left me behind instead of my grandmother. Nevertheless, as much as I would want to rationalize her decision, the guilt was never distant because it was her own guilt that was displaced unto me. And so as we exited the ghetto, I couldn't see much. And so the experience became one big blur. My mother was clutching me by my hand as I was stumbling next to her. I felt like I was being dragged. I asked where we were going and I got no response. As it turned out, we were to spend the night in the home of a Polish couple that used to work for my parents. I found out that these people were storing some of my parents' valuables for safekeeping until the liberation. If we didn't survive, then all of these items would remain with the family. We experienced a sense of relief and freedom in living the ghetto. But little did we know that our prison-like existence was just beginning. We woke up the next morning to a gloomy rainy day. The sky was overcast, as thick, dark clouds rolled over the city. That scenario was good as this way my mother and I would not be visible. After we ate, the gentleman told us that the ghetto was surrounded by the German troops, which meant that it was being liquidated. I didn't fully comprehend that all the residents of the ghetto were being sent to concentration camps. 
I still nurtured the hope that my grandmother would survive and that I would see her. I entertained that fantasy for a long time until it finally hit me how she must have felt being all alone with the knowledge that soon she was going to die. We then began a trek across the city to our prepared hiding place. My mother had a dark complexion and dark curly hair, and so she wrapped a large thick scarf to cover most of her features. I, however, being fair skinned and blonde, was left uncovered. Such a precaution was necessary since we were close to the ghetto. There was at least one other time when my being fair skinned and blonde was an essence, essence that may have contributed to our survival. My mother hailed a horse-drawn carriage that took us across the city. I could tell that it was far because the house that we entered was close to the railroad tracks. The house was situated in the middle of nowhere, which was safe from prying ice. We entered a small, undistinguished looking cottage, which was inhabited by an older woman with two daughters. The house had all types of religious crosses and icons on the walls, which was strange and fascinating at the same time. Being exposed to all of these non-Jewish religious items at first made me uncomfortable. It made me feel that I was being disloyal to the one and only Jewish deity. The old woman that was going to hide us was short, witch-like with a deformed spine. One of the daughters had a reddish hair with an angry pinched face where the other one was indistinct. My mother and the old woman engaged in a lengthy discussion that probably dealt with the payment for hiding us. We then walked a couple hundred yards to a large tool shed on a small elevation. We entered the shed through large wooden doors with huge windows, which looked out onto the railroad yards. There were wooden counters around the walls of the shed. And beneath one of the counters was a trap door that went down a ladder into the cellar that contained 18 people. This hiding place was to be our home for the next 11 months. Initially, the people did not appear distinctive, which was probably a function of the darkness and my anxiety. I noticed a blonde haired boy that was a couple years older. His name was Lorek, Lolek, and he was there with his parents. There was an attractive young woman, probably in her 20s. She was alone, and her name was Rivka. Harmony was a non existent quality, as there were frequent fights, probably about space and money. In theory, we should have been one big happy family, but it never became a reality until the very end when our survival was at stake. Until that very desperate moment, we existed in a constant state of tension and fear. There was fear in relation to what was happening outside, especially trusting the three women. Would they betray us? I think that we also experienced fear in relation to one another, as tempers were short with frequent flare-ups over minor issues. How this was place was set up ahead of time and who was involved in its construction was never talked about. How this Polish family was found was also not known. They took a large risk in making this commitment and one could possibly label them as righteous Gentiles. However, they earned a lot of money for undertaking and the end they tried to betray us, but it was too late. All the same, they took a big risk and we, if we were discovered, they would be shot for harboring Jews. For that alone, we appreciated what they did. Seeing our hiding place for the first time made a profound impression on me. At various times, it was seen as a large cellar, a basement, and it looked like a big cavern that housed 20 bodies of various shapes and sizes. The primary characteristic that has stayed with me all these years was the constant darkness. There was no electricity, we had few candles, and we did not use them, and the walls were brick and very thick. Either by chance or design, a brick was removed from the eastern wall, which let in some light in the daytime. The Russian armies that liberated us came from the east. On a rainy or gloomy day, we were in almost total darkness. I was always conscious of what incidents from my life in the ghetto left permanent marks on my personality. The wish to avoid darkness at all costs was a significant preoccupation in my life. In the cavern, most of the beds were lined along the walls as most of the people had few belongings and there was limited space. The place was kept relatively clean as most of us tried to be cooperative on a day-to-day -day basis, but it was a struggle. 
Most of the time we stayed downstairs and only in the evening we ventured into the shed, two, three people at a time. This was essential in order to keep quiet and not to call attention to the place. It was important to enjoy the little freedom that was allotted to us. The three caretakers made sure that we stayed in the prescribed boundaries. We had a strange hostile dependent relationship with the three women. They brought us the food twice a day in pails and large buckets or removing waste. The two daughters brought us the food and we never saw the old lady except at the very end. The food consisted of soups, bread, fruit and vegetables. It was adequate. We had minimal, minimal interactions with the women, but we always wondered what they were thinking. I do not remember some of the people, even though we were thrown together in such tight quarters. However, I can recall those individuals that had an impact. The person I remember the most was a gentleman in his 50s, whose name was Jablonski. He was a great storyteller, and so I spent a lot of my time with him, partly because both of us experienced physical problems. I with my sensitive stomach, while he with his arthritic pains. I remember laying on the bunk next to his and being enthralled by stories about the tales of the Arabian Nights, Sinbad the Sailor, and the Princess Scheherazade. He was the moral compass of the group and the final arbiter of disagreements, as there were many. Another person that stood out in my mind was the young woman, Rivka. She was personable, outgoing, and most importantly, she spoke German. Rivka spoke German flawlessly, which was probably something that she learned in school. She was instrumental in our survival. We would have never made it without her. Lolok was the other youngster and he was 10 while I was seven. For some reason, he and I never connected, although he was always friendly. I ran into him after the liberation and he introduced me to his friends as someone that he survived with. That made me feel good, almost like a younger brother. The only other people that I remember is a family called Epsin. It consisted of a couple in their forties and with an adolescent boy and girl. Thinking back, I can't help but wonder what we did all the time and how we passed the days. We had minimal reading material, which was in Polish. We didn't have any books or cards or games to pass the time. Perhaps this was one of the reasons why there were so many arguments as there were no outlet to discharge excessive emotional energy. Boredom and anxiety were constant presence. I think we slept a lot. In the evenings and at night, we would open the trap door and climb up into the shed on a rotating basis. We looked forward to these upper level excursions as it gave us a limited sense to experience the outer world without having to step outside. I recall a scary incident when we were in the shed in the evening. Someone dropped something accidentally, which made a loud noise. A guard patrolling the railroad yards looked in our direction. We froze as it seemed that he was looking right at us, even though we were some distance away. We were fearful that he would come closer to investigate, but it did not happen and he continued on his rounds. And so we breathed a sigh of relief. Even though time dragged on, spring turned into summer and we had the sense that there were changes in the air that were unrelated to the change of the seasons. The railroad yards were busier with more traffic and we could count the trains carrying troops and supplies from west to east. We could also see an increase in fortification, anti-aircraft guns and lots of barbed wire and camouflage. We figured out the reason for this heightened activity. One night we heard numerous airplanes, air raid sirens, searchlights and the explosion of bombs. We assumed that these were Russian planes and we were joyful that the war was coming closer and that we will soon be liberated. However, our initial excitement subsided <clears throat> when a bomb exploded within our line of sight. A large part of the bomb's casing lodged beneath one of our windows that could have easily decimated a portion of our hiding place. We didn't fully appreciate that railroad yards can become an inviting target for bombing. Initially, the air raids were only at night, and for a while they increased in frequency and intensity and occurred in the daytime. Sleeping became extremely difficult as people would stay up at night to keep track of the ongoing activities. We were anxious that our hiding place could be bombed. There was an increase in the massing of troops in the area and an increase in fortifications. 
And so one night, all three of the women showed it up to discuss future plans and changes in routine. Not a good sign. It was evident that the war zone was moving closer, but we had no idea how this change would affect us. The first thing they demanded was that from now on, we have to remain in the cellar all the time. Otherwise we could be detected as there were more eyes all around. No more visits to the shed at night. They also will remain in their house, which meant less frequent visits, which implied less food. They demanded that we ration the food. Even in the cellar, we were expected to be quiet and whisper to one another as they were aware of our tendency to argue frequently. They were much more cognizant of the possibility of being discovered and the implication of our presence. I suppose they could plead ignorance about being there, perhaps one or two people. However, how could they explain 20 people on their property without being aware? And so as the days of increased confinement wore on, we became more tense and spent every second, every day, peering out through our little window for any telltale signs of what was happening outside. We created all sorts of fantasies and fanciful scenarios about the outside world. We were hoping for a quick German surrender with the appearance of Russian troops. However, what happened was just the opposite. As the bombings diminished, <clears throat> we became aware of artillery fire, which meant that the war was drawing closer and that we could find ourselves right in the midst of it. We kept track of the explosions and their intensity, but our conclusions were pure guesswork. We lost complete contact with the three women. As a result, we became totally isolated from an outside world without food and without water. We were aware of the frantic activity right above us in the shed as they were the barking of orders in German. And so instead of our wishes for the Germans to surrender meekly, it became evident that our shed had become a focus of another Stalingrad-like battle. I had no inkling at the time that this was going to become the most horrendous week of my life. And so after being cooped up for long stretches of time with limited access to the outside world, we became somewhat attuned to what was occurring outside. So this is how we assessed the military situation. The Russians were in a village a couple hundred yards away as we could see the red flag. The Russians were very fond of their artillery, so they used that instead of infantry to dislodge the Germans. <clears throat> the Germans were in a great position defensively as our cellar and shed were on an elevation with ex excellent visual command of the area. They either had one or two machine guns that kept the Russians at bay by sp spraying the area intermittently. The staccato machine gun fire became a familiar sound. So there emerged a military stalemate between the Russian artillery and the German machine guns. The Russians were hoping that their superior artillery could knock the Germans and their liberation of the area would be easy. The problem with that plan was that we were caught right in the middle. And so this standoff lasted for four days and three nights. By the way, our amateur assessment of the military issues was accurate as we were later informed. Since it was the middle of summer, it was extremely hot and we became desperate. Two other people drank their own urine. I licked the dew from the bricks in the morning. The tension, the thirst and the hunger were just too much. We could tolerate the hunger, but the thirst was awful. The Germans above us in the shed, the uncertainty of our fate and the liberation so close yet so far, all these stresses were just too much. As a result, Mr. Epstein, his son, and our friend Moishi lifted the trap door and ran out of the cellar. Just where they would go and what they were planning to accomplish was not clear as this was a desperate suicidal act. And so we then waited for the Germans to come down after the men ran out. We deliberated what to do and for how long we could tolerate such conditions. <clears throat> there were suggestions that we should run out and take our chances. Maybe we could tell them but who we are and hope that they would be merciful and let us live. If we all ran out and scattered in different directions, then maybe some of us would survive. And so on the afternoon of the fourth day, the thing that we dreaded the most finally happened. The trapdoor opened very slowly 
and the head of a helmeted German soldier peered into our hiding place. He came down the ladder and then another one and the third one, and they looked around with a certain amusement. What they saw was a bunch of women and two blonde haired boys. The men were hidden out of sight under the beds covered with blanket, blankets and clothing. And then Rivka, our German speaking savior, sprang into action. She told them that we were Polish and that we were hiding from the Russians. We heard that the Russian soldiers are savages and they rape women and they kill children. We told them that we were hungry and thirsty and we have been hiding from the Russians for four days. All that was not preplanned, it was a spontaneous story that the Germans believed. Today, to this day, I will never understand why they believed us. They made no connection between us and the three men that ran out the day before. Now, these were hardened frontline troops preoccupied with their own survival in the midst of fighting a war. And so for the next four days, we coexisted with the Wehrmacht. They treated us well, they gave us water and little food, and one of the soldiers actually gave me a piece of chocolate. They never looked, nor did they discover the men hidden under the beds. And so we shared our space with our enemy who could turn at us at any minute and kill us. And so the fear and the terror that consumed us during those four days were beyond comprehension. It became obvious that our hiding place has become a primary fortification against the onrushing Red Army. By the second day, the Germans built a trench through the cellar to the back of the shed where they set up a command post. There was a table with a map and telephones. Constant orders were going back and forth. There was an invisible wall between them and us as they went about the business of war. All that we cared about was survival. It was essential for us to remember to talk in Polish among ourselves, which was easy, not easy, and occasionally forgotten. Rufka became a policewoman in our conscience to make sure that we were quiet, that we whispered only in Polish, and that Lolak and I were prominently displayed. There was a major incident during the second day of our coexistence. The Germans were dug into their positions and they were not dislodged while the Russian artillery shelling intensified. Suddenly, a Russian artillery shell made a direct hit on the eastern wall of our hiding place and it seemed like everything exploded. The wall started to crumble, bricks were flying all over, there was dust and chaos. People were screaming and a woman was sobbing in Yiddish that she was being buried alive. People pulled her out and she was fine, except someone put their hand over her, her mouth to keep her quiet. In my panic, I ran into the German command post to get away from the chaos into a place of safety. The German soldiers shooed me back into the cellar. They were yelling at me, rouse, rouse, which means get out. The next thing that I remembered was that someone grabbed me by the shoulders and pulled me back into the cellars. In some miraculous way, the explosion led to few minor scratches and injured no one. The old woman continued to scream and cry in Yiddish, and once again, someone forcibly closed her mouth. After the explosion, our hardly hiding place was totally in rubble. Some of the men were terrified of being buried alive, so we repositioned them, while the soldiers were too busy to notice. Soldiers congregated in the command post, poring over their maps, while we were hopeful that they were planning to withdraw. While this was going on, they gave us some crackers and water. It was obvious that they had more important things in their minds than who were the strange people next to them. As far as they were concerned, we did not exist. With the line of sight cleared, we now saw the red flag fluttering in the breeze. We were also aware of much more activity in the flag area. Perhaps the Russian troops were massing for a frontal assault on the German positions. It seemed that German machine guns were not chattering as frequently. We were in a constant state of dread as we had no idea what was coming next. We sat or lay on the floor attached to our spots like statues. Now we were also scared of the Russian artillery as we were wide open targets without any protection. Someone suggested that we should wave a piece of red cloth, but it was felt not to be such a clever idea. And so we continued to sit and wait for the next explosion. The third night it became evident that the Germans were getting ready to retreat. It was getting quieter and it looked like they were collecting their equipment, disconnecting their phone cables and folding their maps. We heard snatches of conversation, but there were fewer voices 
and some strange sounds. A German officer came to talk to Rivka. He told her that they were retreating, but they were going back to the city to continue the battle. They suggested that we come along as the Russians were wild animals that rape women and kill children. For our safety, we should retreat with them. Otherwise, he could not guarantee our fate. She thanked him for his concern, and she needed to consult with the rest of us to make it look like we were debating what we should do. We had no intention of going back with him, of course. She went back and told him that the children are sick from the lack of food and water, and we were just too weak to go anywhere. The hidden issue, of course, was the men under the beds and what would happen to them if we left. She told him that we would take our chances and we would remain here. He wished us luck and said that he could not do any more for us. Then he said goodbye and he left. And so the rest of the night was probably one of the longest nights of our lives because we sat and waited with no idea to what was happening around us. We heard women's voices and perhaps the Polish women were betraying us. There was also the question of the three men that ran out, where were they? And would they tell the Germans about the rest of us? We sat there the whole night in total silence and terror. It seemed like any second something bad could happen and we were helpless. At dawn, it began to rain heavy at first and then light drizzle. We still refused to, refused to move as everything around us was quiet. The explosions moved further away, which was a good sign. But we sat in the midst of our minimal shelter as everything was a pile of rubble. And so from the silence, we hear the first Russian words that I'll never forget. Gdje komandir nasherote, which means, where is the commander of our squad? We looked at each other, not knowing what to do. And we were about to respond when one person said, don't move, it's a trick by the Germans. If they see us happy to see the Russians, they will shoot us. And so once again, we sat and waited, I don't know how long. And then a Russian soldier appeared and we looked up and there was another one and another one. And suddenly we realized that we were free. We didn't know what to do. We kept saying spasibo, spasibo, which means thank you over and over. We shook their hands and we hugged them. We finally made sense that we were free and that no one would threaten us anymore. We cried because we were happy and the Russians could not comprehend our happiness because the Poles and Lithuanians were still hoping that the Germans would come back. However, we were happy because we knew otherwise. And so there was a certain beauty an irony to our liberation that's important to mention. Sort of like a footnote. The commanding officer of the Russian troops that liberated us was a major, he was Jewish. He said that we were the first Jews that he had come across since the city of Minsk, which is in Belarus, 400 kilometers away. He kept marveling how it was that we survived since he aimed his artillery batteries at our shed and cellar. The fact that his artillery didn't kill or even wound any one of us that was a miracle in itself. And so the beauty of the story is that the Jew liberated us and freed us from the Nazis. By Jew, by Jew was the ultimate victory. It didn't get any better than that. And so it was the summer of 1944. And even though I was eight years old, I knew that something was different and that something was starting to change inside of me. I knew that we survived some bad things, but my mother came out of it and I came out of it in decent shape. I started to think about the future, about going to school, about running around with other kids, about riding bikes and about reading books, which is something I had never done before. These thoughts kept coming back over and over again because they were harbingers of things to come. And so it occurred to me to remember and to record what, had been, what we had been through. And that's exactly what I did. It appeared that all these new thoughts were swirling around in my head because everything else was behind me. And so I realized that all the other good things that were happening, this was not the end of anything at all, but it was only the beginning. You ready to take a couple questions? Yes. Okay. Um, 
the first one I have is, um, have you been back to Poland or Europe in general? And what was that experience like, if so? Uh, I've been back to Europe numerous times. I've never been back to Poland. I've never had the desire to go back there. Um, and you mentioned you had family in Israel. Do you get to go there often? Oh, yes. Them? We've been to Israel four times over the years. And as I mentioned, I, we exchange uh, emails, we exchange pictures with our families in Israel, and we've maintained sporadic contact with them. Okay. Um, what brought you to your career path as a psychologist? And did your experience impact? Oh, of course. I mean, with all the losses that I've experienced, it couldn't be otherwise. I mean, uh, you know, when you sometimes in our profession, when you've gone through something yourself, you're more adept at helping others who are struggling with the same thing. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, when did you start sharing your story and why do you feel it's important to do so? Well, that's interesting because you hear of many situations where parents who've gone through what I have gone through did not tell their children or tell them very little about what was experienced. Uh, mind doing it came around in a peculiar, somewhat unusual way. We were, uh, we had a Seder at our house and uh, everybody was out of town except our immediate family, my wife and I and our three kids. And so instead of having a Seder, I said to the kids, would you like to hear what happened to us? And they said, of course. And that's when I told them in detail our experiences. And I think they've remembered it ever since. Um, what, what was your experience like for you and your family coming to the U.S.? Um, well, my mother remarried after the war. And so um, my stepfather had family in the United States, of all places in a city in Illinois called Peoria, which most people have found it to be humorous. But um, we had family there. And uh, I started, I was caught up with my schooling pretty quickly. And I was very well accepted and received by the American kids. I, fortunately, I was able to learn English pretty quickly. I was 13 years old at the time. I was able to master English in about three, four months. And so consequently, I made a lot of friends and uh, I was always well received. I was always people were all interested uh, in what who I was and where I came from, and and you know what was my background, but um, not that not too interested. Uh, and so it, it, adapting to being in the United States was pretty easy for me. Great. And then, um, how how did you and your wife meet? <laughs> Why do you want to tell us? No, you can tell. <laughs> You're doing great. Uh, my wife and I met in a kind of indirect way. Uh, I had a friend in medical school, and his parents belonged to a stock club. They, they lived in Glencoe. And uh, so, and they became, they were friendly with my wife's parents. And so one time, um, we, we were introduced, sort of, and I called her. And uh, actually, at the time, I was dating somebody else but I called her and um, at the time I was in addition to being a third year medical student I also had a job I was working at Garfield Park Hospital as an extern and so I finally called her it took me some time to get up the nerve and um, we talked on the phone for two and a half hours now that doesn't seem much in itself except I hate to talk on the phone so consequently it, it was a hint that there was something here going beyond what was on the surface. And I waited, my wife completed her schooling and then we were married, what, a couple years later? No, I year, finished school finished early school. Get married. That's right, she finished school early so we could get married earlier. And so we did and we've been married for 58 years and we have three children and eight grandchildren. That's amazing. Um, Following up with that, actually, what marriage advice do you both have for people? Oh my God, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a that's a tricky question. I mean, everybody has their own ideas, and I don't know. I, I think the main thing is uh, that uh, in terms of conflictual issues, we support each other. 
uh, I think, the, I mean, fortunately, our kids have turned out well. And I think one of the main reasons that they have turned out the way they did is because my wife and I were pretty much in agreement how kids should be raised and how we should be with them. But beyond that, I, I have, I don't have any brilliant voice, words of advice. If you did, it's, honey, you'd be really. I'd be, write, I'd be writing books. Yeah, well, I have book. <laughs> yeah, another book. Uh, no, I, I think it was more a matter of common sense, and we just looked at certain things the same way. That's wonderful. That actually is great advice, though. Um, what life advice do you have for your children and grandchildren? Well, I think they're the only one main thing. They should figure out and learn who they are and where they came from. I think if they know that, everything else will fall into place. I love that. Um, I think that is all the questions we have right now. So I will let you have the final send off. Well, thank you for listening to my story. I somewhat have to apologize for getting so emotional, but um, can't be helped sometimes. And uh, I appreciate the chances I've had to share my story with others. And I hope people have learned some things from what I had to say and perhaps were able to make it a part of their lives. So thank you for inviting me. Thank <laughs> you.